Here we are back to the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Today it's the Duffel Puds Made Happy. <laughs> Lucy followed the great line out into the passage and at once she saw coming towards them an old man barefoot dressed in a red robe. His white hair was crowned with a chaplet of oak leaves. His beard fell to his girdle and he supported himself with a curiously carved staff. When he saw Aslan, he bowed low and said, Welcome, sir, to the least of your houses. Do you grow weary, Coriakin, of ruling such foolish subjects as I have given you here? No, said the magician. They are very stupid, but there is no real harm in them. I begin to grow rather fond of the creatures. Sometimes, perhaps, I'm a little bit impatient, waiting for the day when they can be governed by wisdom instead of this rough magic. All in good time, Coriakin, said Aslan. Yes, all in very good time, sir, was the answer. Do you intend to show yourself to them? Nay, said the lion, with a little half-growl that meant Lucy thought the same as a laugh. I should frighten them out of their senses. Many stars will grow old and come to take their rest in the islands before your people are ripe for that. And today, before sunset, I must visit Trumpkin the dwarf, where he sits in the castle of Care Paravel, counting the days, till his master Caspian comes home. I will tell him all your story, Lucy. Do not look so sad. We shall meet soon again. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, what do you call soon? I call all times soon, said Aslan, and instantly he, has, he was vanished away, and Lucy was alone with the magician. Gone, said he, and you and I quite crestfallen. It's always like that. You can't keep him. It's not as if he were a tame lion, and how did you enjoy my book? Part of it very much indeed, said Lucy. Did you know I was there all the time? Well, of course I knew when I let the duffers make themselves invisible that you would be coming along presently to take the spell off. I wasn't quite sure of the exact day, and I wasn't especially on the watch this morning. You see, they have made me invisible too, and being invisible always makes me so sleepy. I ho there I'm yawning again. Are you hungry? Well, perhaps a little, said Lucy. I've no idea what the time is. Come, said the magician. All times may be soon to Aslan, but in my home, all hungry times are one o'clock. <laughs> he led her a little way down the passage and opened a door. Passing in, Lucy found herself in a pleasant room full of sunlight and flowers. The table was bare when they entered, but it was, of course, a magic table, and at a word from the old man, the tablecloth, silver plates, glasses, and food appeared. I hope that that is what you would like, said he. I have tried to give you food more like the food of your own land than perhaps you have had lately. Oh, it's lovely, said Lucy, and so it was. An omelet, piping hot, cold lamb and green peas, a strawberry ice, lemon squash to drink with the, the meal, and, and a cup of chocolate to follow. But the magician himself drank only wine and ate only bread. There was nothing alarming about him, and Lucy and he were soon chatting away like old friends. When will the spell work? asked Lucy. Will the duffers be visible again at once? Oh, yes. They're visible now, but they're probably all asleep still. They always take a rest in the middle of the day. And now that they're visible, are you going to let them off being ugly? Will you make them as they were before? Well, that's rather a delicate question, said the magician. You see, it's only they who think they were so nice to look at before. They say they've been uglified, but that isn't what I called it. Many people might say the change was for the better. Are they awfully conceited? Oh, they are. Or at least the chief duffer is, and he's taught all the rest to be. They always believe every word he says. We'd notice that, said Lucy. Yes, we get on better without him in a way. Of course, I could turn him into something else or even put a spell on him, which would make them not believe a word he said, but I don't like to do that. It's better for them to admire him than to admire nobody. Don't they admire you? asked Lucy. Oh, not me, said the magician. They wouldn't admire me. What was it you uglified them for? I mean, what they call uglified. Well, they wouldn't do what they were told. Their work is to mind the garden and raise food. Not for me, as they imagine, but for themselves. 
They wouldn't do it at all if I didn't make them. And of course, for a garden, you want water. There's a beautiful spring about half a mile away up the hill, and from that spring there flows a stream which comes right past the garden. All I asked them to do was to take their water from the stream instead of trudging up to the spring with their buckets two or three times a day and tying themselves out beside, spilling half of it on the way back. But they wouldn't see it. In the end, they refused point blank. And are they as stupid as all that? asked Lucy. The magician sighed. You wouldn't believe the troubles I've had with them. A few months ago, they were all wishing, washing up the plates and knives before dinner. They said it saved time afterwards. I've caught them planting boiled potatoes to save cooking them when they were dug up. One day, the cat got into the dairy and 20 of them were at work moving all the milk out. No one thought of moving the cat. But I see you finished. Let's go and look at the duffers now. They can be, be looked at. They went into another room, which was full of polished instruments hard to understand, such as astrolabies, or oreries, chronoscopes, posimeters, coriambuses, and theod theodolans. And here they had come to the window, the magician said, uh, and here. When they had come to the, the window, and the magician said, there, there are your duffers. I don't see anybody, said Lucy. And what are those mushroom things? The things she pointed at were dotted all over the level grass. They were certainly very like mushrooms, but far too big. The stalks about three feet high and the umbrellas about the same length from edge to edge. When she looked carefully, she noticed too that the stalks joined the umbrellas, not in the middle, but at the end, uh, but, at, but at one side, which gave an unbalanced look to them. And there was something, a sort of little bundle lying on the grass at the foot of each stalk. In fact, the longer she gazed at them, the less like mushrooms they appeared. The umbrella part was not really round, as she had thought at first. It was longer than it was broad, and it widened at one end. There were a great many of them, fifty or more. The clock struck three instantly, a most extraordinary thing happened. Each of the mushrooms suddenly turned upside down. The little bundles which had lain at the bottom of the stalks were heads and bodies. The stalks themselves were legs, but not two legs to each body. Each body had a single thick leg right under it, not to one side like a leg of, one, of a one-legged man, and at the end of it, a single enormous foot, a broad-toed foot with toes curling up a little so that it looked rather like a small canoe. She saw in a moment why they had looked like mushrooms. They had been lying flat on their backs, each with its single leg straight up in the air and its enormous foot spread out above it. She learned afterwards that this was their ordinary way of resting, for the foot kept off both rain and sun, and for a monopod, mono means one, pod foot, one foot, for a monopod to lie under its own foot is almost as good as being in a tent. Oh, the funnies, the funnies, cried Lucy, bursting into laughter. Did you make them like that? Yes, yes, I made the duffers into monopods, said the magician. He too was laughing till the tears ran down his cheeks. But watch, he added. It was worth watching. Of course, these little one-footed men couldn't walk or run as we do. They got about by jumping like fleas or frogs, and what jumps they made, as if each big foot were a mass of springs, and with what a bounce they came down, and, and that was what made the thumping noise which had so puzzled Lucy yesterday. For now they were jumping in all directions and calling out to one another, Hey, lads, we're visible again. Visible we are, said one in a tasseled red cap who was obviously the chief monopod. And what I say is, when the chaps are visible, why, they can see one another. <laughs> ah, there it is, there it is, chief, cried all the others. There's the point. No one's got a clearer head than you. You couldn't have made it plainer. She caught the old man napping that little girl did to the, mon the chief monopod. We've beaten him this time. Just what we were going to say ourselves, chimed the chorus. You're going stronger than ever today, chief. Keep it up, keep it up. But do they dare to talk about, uh, but do they dare to talk about you like that, said Lucy? They seem to be so afraid of you yesterday. Don't they know you might be listening? That's one of the funny things about duffers, said the magician. 
One minute they talk as if I ran everything and overheard everything and was extremely dangerous. The next moment they think they can take me in by tricks that a baby would see through. Bless them. Well, they have to be turned back into their proper shapes, said Lucy. Oh, I do hope it wouldn't be unkind to leave them as they are. Do they really mind very much? They seem pretty happy. I say, look at, their, at that jump. What were they be like before? Common little dwarfs, said he. Nothing like, nothing like so nice as the sort you have in Narnia. It would be a pretty change, pity to change them back, said Lucy. They're so funny, and they're rather nice. Do you think it would make any difference if I told them that? Oh, I'm sure it would, if you could get it into their heads. Will you come with me and try? No, no. They'll, you'll get in on far better without me. Thanks awfully for the lunch, said Lucy, and turned quickly away. She ran down the stairs, which she had come up so nervously that morning, and canoed uh, and cannoned into Edmund at the bottom. All the others were there with him, waiting, and Lucy's conscience smote her when she saw their anxious faces and realized how long she had forgotten them. It's all right, she shouted. Everything's all right. The magician's a brick, and I've even and I've seen him, Aslan. After that, she went on, went from them like the wind, and out into the garden. Here the earth was shaking with the jumps and the air ringing with the shouts of the monopods. Both were redoubled when they caught sight of her. Here she comes, here she comes, they cried. Three cheers for the little girl. Ah, she put it across the old gentleman properly, she did. And we're extremely regrettable, <laughs> said the chief monopod, that we can't give you the pleasure of seeing us as we were before. We were uglified, for you wouldn't believe the difference, and that's the truth, for there's no denying... We're mortal ugly now, so we won't you won't deceive we won't deceive you. Eh, hey, that we are, chief, that we are, echoed the others, bouncing like so many toy balloons. You've said it, you've said it. But I don't think you are at all, said Lucy, shouting to make him herself heard. I think you look very nice. Hear her, hear her, said the monopods. True for you, Missy. Very nice we look. You couldn't have find a, a handsomer lot. They said this without any surprise and did not seem to notice that they had changed their minds. She's a saying, remarked the chief monopod, as how we looked very nice before we were all uglified. True for you, chief, true for you, chanted the others. That's what she says we heard ourselves. I did not, bawled Lucy. I said you're very nice now. So she did, so she did, the chief monopod, um, said the chief monopod, said we were nice then. Hear them both, hear them both, said the monopods. There's a pair for you. Always right. They couldn't have put it better. But we're saying just the opposite, said Lucy, stamping her foot with impatience. So you are, to be sure, so you are, said the monopods. Nothing like an opposite. Keep it up, both of you. You're enough to drive anyone mad, said Lucy, and gave it up. But the monopods seemed perfectly contented, and she decided that on the whole, the conversation had been a success. And before everyone went to bed that evening, something else happened, which made them even more satisfied with their one-legged condition. Caspian and all the Narnians went back as soon as possible to the shore to give their news to Rents and the others on board the Don Treader, who were by now in considerable anxiety. And of course, the monopods went with them, bouncing like footballs and agreeing with one another in loud voices till Eustace said, I wish the magician would make them inaudible instead of, vis instead of invisible. He was soon very... He was soon sorry he had spoken because then he had to explain that an inaudible thing is something you can't hear. And though he took a lot of trouble, he never felt sure that the monopods had really understood. And what especially annoyed him was that they said in the end, eh, he can't put things the way our chief does. But you'll learn, young man. Hark to him. He'll show you how to say things. There's a speaker for you. When they reached the bay, Rippy Cheap had a brilliant idea. He had his little coracle lowered and paddled himself about in it till the monopods were thoroughly interested. He then stood up and said, Worthy and intelligent monopods, you do not need boats. Each of you has a foot that will do instead. Just jump as lightly as you can on the water and see what happens. The chief monopod hung back and warned the others that they'd find the water powerful wet, but one or two of the younger ones tried it almost at once, and then a few others followed their example. And at last, the whole lot did the same. It worked perfectly. The huge single foot of a monopod acted as a natural raft or boat. And when Reepicheep had caught, taught them how to cut 
wrote rude paddles for themselves, they all paddled about the bay and round the Dawn Treader, looking for all the world like a fleet of little canoes, with a fat dwarf standing up in the extreme stern of each. And they had races, and bottles of wine were lowered down to them from the ship as prizes, and the sailors stood leaning over the ship's sides and laughed till their own sides ached. The duffers were also very pleased with their new name of monopods, which seemed to them a magnificent name, though they never got it right. That's what we are, they bellowed. Money pod, money puds, pomonods, uh, poma, potimons, just what it was the tips of our tongues to call ourselves. But they soon got it mixed up with their old name of duffers and finally settled down to the calling themselves duffelpuds. And that is what they probably will probably be called for century, Duffelpuds. <laughs> that evening, all the Narnians dined upstairs with the magician, and Lucy noticed how different the whole top floor looked now that she was no longer afraid of it. The mysterious signs on the doors were still mysterious, but now looked as if they had kind and cheerful meanings, and even the bearded mirror now seemed funny rather than frightening. At dinner, everyone had by had by magic what everyone liked best to eat and drink, and after dinner, the magician did a very useful and beautiful piece of magic. He laid two blank sheets of parchment on the table and asked Drinian to give himself an exact account of their voyage up to date. And as Drinian spoke, something he described, everything he described came out on the parchment in fine, clear lines. Till at last, each sheet was a splendid map of the Eastern Ocean, showing Galma, Terebinthia, the Seven, Island, the Seven Isles, the Lone Islands, Dragon Island, Burnt Island, Deathwater, and the land of the Duffers itself. All exactly the right sizes and in the right positions. They were the first maps ever made of the, those seas and better than any that have been made since without magic. For on these, though the towns and mountains looked at first just as you as they could would on an, any ordinary map, yet when the magician lent them a magnifying glass, you saw that they were perfect little pictures of the real things, so that you could see the very castle and slave market and streets and narrow haven, all very clear, through, though very distant, like things seen through the wrong end of a telescope. The only drawback was that the coastline of most of the islands was incomplete. For the map showed only what Drinian had seen with his own eyes. When they were finished, the magician kept one himself and presented the other to Caspian. It still hangs in his chamber of instruments at Care Paravel, but the magician could tell them nothing about seas or islands further east. He did, however, tell them that about seven years ago, or seven years before, a Narnian ship had put in at his waters, and that she had on board the Lord's Revillian, Argaz, Mavramorn, and Roop. So they judged that the golden man they had seen lying in the death water must be the Lord Restamar. Next day, the magician magically mended the stern of the dawn treader where it had been damaged by the sea serpent and loaded her with useful gifts. And there was a most friendly parting, and when she sailed the two hours after noon, all the duffelpuds paddled out with her to the harbor mouth and cheered until she was out of sound of their cheering. And there's the end of that chapter. Well, we'll be back on Monday for the next chapter, The Dark Island. That'll be Monday. See you then.